Okay, we're just about to get started. If you could take your seats. Good morning, everybody. I'm Christian Eskevin. I'm the new president of the Coronado Roundtable. And welcome. I'm glad uh, all of you could come this morning. Uh, turned out to be sunny uh, instead of rainy, which we were kind of expecting, but uh, it's a beautiful sunny morning. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, now that uh, you're comfortably seated, and uh, that you have some of the uh, coffee provided uh, this morning. Um, we thank uh, Lyman Green for making uh, the coffee this morning. Thank you, Lyman. And now if we could all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, as you uh, may know, our programs are recorded uh, by Zoom. <clears throat> So uh, for those viewing at home, if you could please uh, mute your computer or device, and please also turn off your cameras. Uh, during the uh, uh, question and answer period, there will be a chat box opp opportunity to um, register a question uh, during that question and answer period at the end of the program. And uh, for the recording, we'd like to thank library staff, Selena Viadolid. Thank you. That's close. Uh, and next month, our program will be on March 24th, uh, 10 o'clock here in the wind room. Uh, we will have <clears throat> Gregory Dadis. He is a professor of history at San Diego State University and also the USS Midway Chair in Modern Military History. He will be speaking on faith and fear, America's relationship with war in the modern era. That should be a fascinating program. But now if I could introduce Dave Bean, retired Naval Captain, who will introduce our speaker. Dave. Thank you, Christian. It's my very great honor and pleasure to serve on the board of directors for the uh, Coronado Roundtable. I've been with them for uh, six or eight months now. And uh, first under Kirk's uh, able leadership and now with Christian. So uh, thank you for that opportunity. I want to welcome uh, not only the folks here tonight or the today, but our folks that are here virtually, thank you for joining us. And please uh, make use of the chat room, like Christian said, if you have questions. It's now my pleasure to introduce Francisco Frank Ertassen, who is uh, our port commissioner for the city of Coronado and is also president of the Regional Strategies Group Incorporated, a San Diego based public affairs and strategic communications consulting firm. Previously, uh, Mr. Ertassen served as Regional Vice President of External Relations for Semper, Sempra Energy Services Corporation. I know you're all familiar with that. And over the course of his 38-year career with Sempra, he held several senior-level management positions. Prior to joining SDG&E, Ertassen began his career in the real estate industry and, in fact, today still manages southwesterly properties which contain single and multifamily uh, homes. Throughout his career, uh, Commissioner Natassin has served on numerous local community boards, including but not exclusively 
Chairman of the San Diego Housing Commission, 2017 to 2019, Chairman of San Diego Downtown Partnership, 2015 to 16, and of course, Chairman and Commissioner of the San Diego Unified Port District for 10 years, 1992 to 2002. Mr. Otassen is the first port commissioner in the history of the agency to serve two different member cities on the board. He holds a bachelor's degree from San Diego State University, go Aztecs, and was recognized as an outstanding alumni and the president's honorary degree from Southwestern College. It is now my privilege and honor to represent Commissioner Frank Ertassen. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Appreciate that. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Captain. Christian, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I am Frank Ertassen, and, uh, you know, I was looking at the speakers that this organization invites. I read about it in the paper all the time, and I, quite frankly, I'm humbled that you would invite me to come here to speak with you. Uh, it seems like there's a little bit more interest in what the port's doing these days. And so I'm going to touch on all those things. Not only what's going on here in Coronado, I'll get to the issues that are going on here in Coronado, but I'm also going to touch a little bit on the port in general. Now, I, I'm told that my predecessor, um, the, the Admiral Gary Benelli may have been here. Uh, so you may have heard a little bit about the Port of San Diego, uh, but I'm gonna touch on that. I hope it's not repetitive for you. I hope that it helps you to understand this organization um, that I've been affiliated with, as you now know from my bio for about 30 years. I did serve on the board from 1992 to 2002. Uh, I represented the city of Imperial Beach on there. I was in my 30s. I was probably the youngest guy on the commission at the time. And lo and behold, I'm back. Uh, quite frankly and honestly, folks, uh, I was sitting um, at my our house here on San Luis Ray Avenue and comfortably running my little public affairs firm with shorts and flip flops on when I received the call asking me if I would consider coming back to serve again and to represent the city of Coronado, a, a real honor, okay? The furthest thing from my mind, uh, I asked the guy, I go, what, 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 I don't understand what you're doing. You, you talking to me? <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, we're talking to you and we would like for you to consider it. And I said, well, honestly, I don't know about that. I said, but let me talk to my bride, my high school sweetheart that I've been married to now for 40 years. They said, okay, well, can we call you back in a couple of days? And I said, sure, call me back in a couple of days. Honest truth, folks, it was the furthest thing from my mind. I did receive that call back a couple of days later. And I said, uh-oh, I forgot. I didn't even mention it to Karen. <laughs> That's a true, true story. Um, cut the long story short, I, I agreed to do it. I agreed to throw my hat in the ring. Um, fortunately, uh, there was a lot of great candidates in the, in the running for it. I was the one that got the lucky, uh, the lucky one that got the votes that day. And so I've been representing you on the Port of San Diego board since January of 2022. So roughly 14 months or so that I've been on there. Uh, people ask me, what's it like? And I said, well, it's a bit of a deja vu moment for me. It still is. A lot of the issues that we deal with, I dealt with them 25, 30 years ago. Um, a lot of the projects that I'm gonna talk about today, some here in Coronado, were here before us 25, 30 years ago. I'll talk about that. So it is a bit of a deja vu moment, it's been great. Honestly, it's been a, a lot of fun. Um, I told people it didn't really take me a lot to get up to speed on, on what, what this, how it runs. I know the organization very well. I've been gone for 20 years, but once you learn to ride a bike, you know how to ride a bike. And so that's what it was for me. Uh, I know the role of being a port commissioner. Uh, I know the role of, of being a trustee for the state of California, 
because folks, this agency was built, it was, de- it was, it was developed by the state of California. And Kurt and I was talking about that briefly. And he was telling me about having lived next door to Senator Jim Mills before. And I said, well, he was one of the fathers of this, of the legislation that carried this forward. So I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with the responsibilities. I'm familiar with the duties and how we have to, we represent the, the, the state's interests, people of all the, uh, in, of the whole state. And so here I go. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the port um, in the event, or a little kind of an interesting piece of history. Um, when Senator Mills carried the legislation for the formation of the port district, I think it was 1962. It was early 60s. The question was asked to all five cities around San Diego Bay. Are you willing to tax yourself for the formation of this special purpose district with the hope that one day we're going to have the ability to finance improvements that would improve the quality of our lives? So parks and plazas, and parking lots, piers. Interesting, you think about today, if, when we're, if people are asked today, if we're asked today, are you willing to tax yourself for X, Y, or Z? Those measures don't do too well. Back then, people said yes. Except for one of the cities. Anybody want to guess which one that is? <laughs> Christian, I, you can't play poker with you, brother. You're, you're, you're right there, except for Coronado. But, but the vote was total. And so Coronado had to come in into the, into the fold. So we created the Port District. It's made up of the five cities. And according to the legislation, there are seven board members, three from the city of San Diego, the largest of the five, and then one from every one of the other cities, seven of us. Since that time, what we've seen, you see there before you, the amount of investment that the Port of San Diego has made is almost $2 billion into the, for the betterment of our, of our region. And that's made up of a lot of different things. Currently, it's about a $190 million operation. It's different from when I left it in 2002. Because in 2001, there was legislation that split the airport away from the port. It used to all be combined. It was total then about maybe $320 million operation. Today, it's $190 million minus the airport. It's healthy. Thank God we're back on the straight and narrow after the pandemic. It was a rough, rough couple years. Uh, I wasn't part of, I wasn't there back yet, but I knew that it was a real tough time for them. Why? The obvious. People aren't staying at hotels. People aren't eating at restaurants. The port's funding was just decimated. And so it was a tough time, but they, there was federal help that came in just as I was coming back. And I told Councilman Donovan, this is great, great for me. I mean, I'm coming back and it's no longer is the water right here on us. Now we're able to do things and help out the cities back on. We're healthy again to be able to do that. So $1.9 billion has been invested since 1963 in the region. I would argue that the port is fulfilling its commitment. It's fulfilling that commitment that was made to the electorate that if we're willing to tax ourselves, that we will have a better quality of life down the road. Now, I failed to mention a real important fact, folks, and that is that it was about seven years into that initial years that the port was now up and running. It was now able to generate revenue from its leaseholds. And so they cut the taxing. 
And so the, ta- the tax went off. I, I don't know exact what year, if it was 1969 or 1970, but the tax came off. And the, the port today continues to be an operation that is able to generate economic benefits to the region minus any kind of taxation. So again, I, I would argue that that's a benefit to us. Um, what we'll see, we, we see is, is that this economic engine is made up of a lot of different factors, and I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the hotels and the marinas and what have you that we have. Um, one thing I noted was that uh, Shelter Island, those fingerlings and Harbor Islands were created before the port district was developed, but then the port came in, they had already, those were basically fills that were created, and then the port came in and built all the infrastructure once it was up and running. You, you can see there how, what the makeup of is of the, of the port's operations. Five public piers, museums, 18 hotels, parks. Real proud of the 22 parks around the bay. Every member city has parks in it. For us here, we, we, we're real proud of, obviously, Tidelands Park that we have here. Um, a lot of artwork, uh, restaurants, many restaurants that you go and enjoy today are on Port Tidelands. And then Port is very actively involved in sponsoring events, again, uh, to, to the... Uh, to help the region economically. When, when my staff was preparing this presentation for him, I said, I'm so new to him. I said, look, everything looks great, except for I think you got a misspelled word on there. They said, what is it? And I go, C. I go, that's, and they go, no, no, commissioner, that, that's a tagline that we have. I go, okay. So I wanna make sure that you understand when it says port of land and sea, that's intentional. I thought, how can we misspell that word? But it's not misspelled. Um, let me touch on that uh, for a second there. The cruise line industry is in a very important part of the port operations. But again, that was something that was hit dramatically um, when the pandemic hit. That season, by the way, runs from September to late May or early June. In 2021, there was 137 cancellations. Understandably, that hit the region and the port's pocketbook significantly. About $300 million loss to the region in economic uh, activity. About a $4.8 million loss in revenue to the Port of San Diego. Significant. The good news is that we're past that. The good news is that there's a new day and that we're now being able to, to look forward to some rosier skies ahead. And, and the cruise line industry is one of those. For the 22-23 season, which began in September of last year, we're anticipating 140 calls on the Port of San Diego here. The core business, is uh, it's really, really looking up. Uh, Disney is one of the big ones. Uh, they've more than doubled the cruisers here in San Diego. We, the other ones that we have here as well are Holland America, Princess Cruises, Celebrity Cruises, Norwegian Cruises, and again, the Disney Cruise Line. We have smaller ones that come in per- periodically, and those are, are um, Oceana and American Queen Voyages. Last year, the port was recognized. And by the way, I mean, you know, there's a, we're, we're a relatively small port as compared to others around. The big amount of business that happens in the Florida area. But here on the West Coast, we were real proud that last year we were recognized as the best cruise port in the world. That's a big deal. That's a big deal especially in light of the fact that the facilities that we have here at the Port of San Diego for the cruise industry, if, you, if you've come in and out of there, you'll agree with me, aren't the best. We have work to do there. 
We have investments to make there in order to make that better. So getting that recognition is a big deal. We're real proud, and I'll talk a little bit more about what the port is doing environmentally, but let me just touch while I'm talking about the cruise industry that we just celebrated the completion of the installation of our second shore power facility. What's gone on folks here, not only in the cruise industry, but also in the maritime industry, is that there's a big environmental push by the state of California to turn those diesel engines off when they're at port as a way of trying to you know, mitigate the, the air emissions impacts on the surrounding communities. The Port of San Diego has been quite progressive on that front, has embraced those kinds of, of, of requirements and ran with it. So we just completed the second one um, and, and we're proud of that. So it, they come into the port, they turn their engines off, they hook up to shore power, they're now on the grid. Um, obviously something I'm real familiar with after my 38 year career in the energy industry and, and away we go, we're, everybody's better off for it. Let me just conclude with saying each home port call, just so you get an idea how important this is, has a $2 million impact on our regional economy. It's a big deal. The restaurants love them. All the stores love them. Um, it, you know, hotels, people come here beforehand stay a couple days after. And so it's a big part of our business. It's an important part of our business. I touched on, on what, we're do, what we've done there with the cruise ship industry, but let me, let me step back a little bit and talk a little bit more about environmentally what the port has done. In October of 2021, before I joined the port, the, the commission adopted what they call the marine clean air strategy. That mean, marine clean, clean air strategy has goals of reducing emissions in the area, significant ones. Quite progressive, quite visionary of the port to adopt that. A lot of it was driven by the impacts in the barrio area, no surprise. Well, the port has ran with that. And here's two examples of projects that we've taken on. I believe we are the first in the country to be bringing in mobile cranes, electric mobile cranes. We'll be the first ones that, that are coming into that. They, by the way, are the biggest polluters. That and the, 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 uh, the tugboats that I'll talk about in a second. So we'll bring in this year two uh, cone cranes made in, in uh, I believe they're being made in, in Holland that have a greater lift capacity than previous diesel cranes. These are a big deal. Again, th this is something that we're going to be the first ones to be adopted to putting those in place. The lift capacity on these things is greater. Uh, it's going to help the port a lot more as we continue to expand on our maritime business. The second improvement that we're quite proud of there is the tugboats. Now you don't think about that, but the tugboats are very dirty, very intense diesel emission offset. And so what happens is that we've gone out and teamed with Crowley on the development of a new all electric tug. First one in the country. It's being manufactured in Alabama. It's gonna be an incredible new addition. It's gonna set the tone. I'm quite proud to be affiliated with an agency like the Port of San Diego that is adopting and leaning into these, these environmental causes. It's something that's gonna be affecting us greatly. Now that obviously both of these facilities will be tied up, tied in and connected to the grid. Uh, the port's making a lot of investments in and around the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal to be able to accommodate those facilities and being able to recharge them when it's necessary to do so. I talked about the, uh, the makeup of the port. Um, and as you can see there, 
we have a lot of di a very different makeup of the port. Um, the the Im economic impact, um, the potential for development at the Central Embarcadero. This is something that we've been working on greatly. Um, if you look across the bay, you'll see those three cranes there in Chula Vista. You read about them in the paper, you're aware. The single largest hotel under development in the United States. Big deal. Uh, it's been a dream of the South Bay to be able to have a facilities in the South Bay. And so the port has been working for years right before I came back on with the city of Chula Vista and others to be able to make that project a reality. And that's gonna be a big deal. Uh, $1.3 billion project. Um, you've also maybe been reading in the paper about what is being discussed right now, right across the bay over in Seaport Village. Um, there's been a, a discussion there about a completely new development at the Seaport Village area. Uh, it's early, it's young. These projects take a long time. We'll see what it eventually looks like, but the proposal as it stands right now is something like five hotels, um, 150 to 200,000 square foot of office space, uh, music hall, it's intense but the, port, the board has voted to continue to, study, to start studying the environmental impacts associated with that project. We'll see what happens. I don't believe that at the end of the day, it's going to be what it is today. Uh, like in a lot of cases, those will be reduced in, in size. We'll see the coast, if the Coastal Commission will allow for the development of the office space. It's not a use that's consistent with the public doctrine of the Port of San Diego today. The developer is trying to convince the commission that, that, is, that they can bring in a blue economy, making a tie into that. We'll see what happens on that. Um, as your commissioner, I've been asking a lot of real tough questions. Um, I voted to, to allow it to move on to the environmental assessment stage, but the jury's out still on where it's going to end, folks. And so, even though it's, you see the picture there, it's a real intense development right now. That's not where it's going to end up. We'll see where it goes. It'll be a long time in this, in this planning process. So expect to continue to read about these things going forward. Let me just touch real quickly around the Bay, um, what's going on in uh, National City real quick. And I'm gonna end up coming back into Coronado because I know that there's a little bit of interest on what's going on here. So I, I will touch on that, but let me just say, um, we just, uh, the city of Coronado has been working on this, we, and the port have been working on this balance plan of creating a, a larger park area, realignment of roadways, an improvement on the planning side of the port. We just approved the environmental impact report on that uh, recently. Um, and it's, it's off to, to the Coastal Commission to process along with the port master plan amendment that was required on that project there. So. Um, the, the city of National City is quite excited about this um, and understandably so. It's been primarily a maritime industrial area as you're familiar with. And the city of, of National City for years has been saying, look, we want to also have some tourist oriented facilities. It was, that argument was being made when I was on this, in this role previously. And so now things have changed. Now it's going to, they're gonna create little opportunities. If you go down there today, you'll see there's a great little restaurant there. If you haven't gone there, I highly recommend, go check it out, the galley, or uh, Pier 32, I'm sorry. Um, great little facility there, uh, a marina. That's always been the dream of the city as well. So things are changing in National City and it, a lot of it has to do with the Port of San Diego's involvement there and what we've done to make that a reality. To the city, I was, uh, I represented previously. There's efforts underway for beautification efforts on the pier area. Uh, that will be a, a, nice, a, a nice addition as well um, that will help that city. I mean, as you can tell, if you go down to the coastline in Imperial Beach today, it's, it looks a lot different. Um, the investments that were made back in the 90s um, have really made a huge impact in Imperial Beach along the beachfront. Uh, go in there and try to look at property values and what they are today. 
it's no longer the, the cheap little place that we all remember back in the 70s and 80s. So this, these, uh, this is part of, of improvements that have been done at, at the Port of San Diego has done an Imperial Beach for a long time. Uh, and Commissioner Malcolm now, who represents the city, has been championing these projects and doing a great job. I think they're gonna be beautiful improvements uh, and enhancements there for the city pier area. Let's get on to the stuff that you wanna hear about. You wanna hear about what's going on here in Coronado, the improvements that we're doing here. So let's, let's get into it. First of all, let, did I not click over? All right, let's talk about the ferry landing um, and the approach that we've been taking for development there. I think you will all agree with me the ferry landing little strip center there is a bit tired. Certainly not to our standards here in Coronado. We'd like to see it looking better than that. Um, along the way, there's been a lot of discussion with the, the late lessee about what, we would, what would go there. Uh, at one point, uh, I understand that he had proposed a hotel that was shut down quickly. And so he's come back with a proposal to redo the existing shopping center. The problem is, is that when he proposed the initial concept, it was kind of his thoughts of what he'd like to see there. And that didn't go well. And you all know better than I, if you attended some of those hearings, the public didn't like that modern look that he was proposing. And so I remember just about that time I'm coming back onto the commission and I'm hearing from them and they're saying, you know, this is, this is a real nice development here and the public don't like it. I said, okay. I said, what do they want? And they said, well, they want to see more of a traditional look, more of something that's reflective of Coronado, something along the lines of what the Dell has done and stuff like that. And I said, why don't you give them what they want? Why don't you give the public what they want? That's what, that's what it's about. And so they said, I go, why don't you call, call your architect and come back up and repropose something that the public is asking for? And they did. I give them credit for that. They did that. And they showed it back to you again. And the public went, yeah, that's what we want to see. And so I'm delighted to tell you folks that we are, this project now has been submitted for processing. It's underway. These things take a while to get through the, the bureaucracy, but it's going to happen. And it's going to be something I think that we're all going to be real proud of. And I certainly, in, based upon the feedback that we've been receiving from the public, it's what the public wants. And so I'm excited about that. It's going to be something that's going to be reflective of what we want here in Coronado. And it's going to be new and nice. And we have a high standards. We live in a beautiful city. And so we're going to have something that I think is going to meet our standards. Excuse me. Let me um, move on from here to another parcel at the ferry landing you read about in the papers. I've heard a lot of interest in it. That is controlled by the same lessee. Different terms of that agreement, and that is the lot, the restaurant pad at the ferry landing. Uh, always contemplated, folks, even before, and, I, and when I talk about being deja vu me, for me coming back, it's because projects like this. This was here when I was dealing with it 25 years ago. It was always contemplated to be a second restaurant next to the El Fornile. Hasn't happened. But that's what's, what, what is, is moving forward still today. Now, I know, I know. People have different interests in there. People say, no, that's not what we want. We'd like to see a park, whatever. You have an opportunity to weigh in on that. And I'll talk about the port's master plan update. I'll talk about that in a little bit of what that is. But the port has gone out and, and, and shared what 
potential new uh, uses will be in the various port lands, including this property here. And the mayor and city council have discussed it. I take direction from them, their direction to me, and something quite frankly that I personally agree with is that this is going to be a restaurant someday. Now I know that doesn't sit well with everybody. I understand that you would love to try to convince me to fight otherwise, but not on this. Um, I've mentioned to people that will listen is that I will not get myself involved in the middle between business arrangements, between the Port of San Diego and lessees, financial commitments that have been made, it's not the right thing to do. And so this project will move forward when I'm not exactly sure. But the, it's, it, the, the lessee is actively engaged uh, with, with potential, restaurant, uh, potential restaurant for the site. And it's going forward, and I believe that it will, uh, it will happen while I'm in, as your representative. Let's go to the real hot one. Let's go to the real good one. When I decided I was going to jump into this and, and, and go for this position, I thought to myself, Coronado's, that's going to be easy. <laughs> you know, Coronado doesn't need a lot. Coronado's great. Seven months into my assignment, all of a sudden things got real hot for me. And that is because, by the way, another deja vu, okay? I remember dealing with the previous option E on this property who wanted to build a hotel on this property. So I was real familiar with it. I've been familiar with it for 30 years. Even though I represented Imperial Beach, I met with the Coronado Cays community a lot where they expressed their views of what they wanted and not wanted it down in, in this land. So I'm familiar with it. Seven months into this assignment, we get a proposal dropped on us. Now, in all honesty, I met with the developer in February, a year ago, February of, of 2022. I had been on the seat for 30, 45 days, thereabouts. He met me, me and wanted to present this new concept that he had. This new idea for 41 cottages there at the, at, at, at the Grand Caribbean Shoreline Park area. A lease that he controls through 2034. Showed me that, I met with this architect and he said to me, I want your support. The honest truth is that I said to him, shame on you. You need to work with the community, I told him. There's 1,200 residences approximately here at the case. You need to reach out to them. I knew how hot this was politically. And so it didn't matter to me so much what the project was, though I took note that it was a much smaller scaled project than what we had we had seen before in other proposals, including one by him. My concern was on the process. And if you read the local newspaper or you read other articles that come out, the comments that are attributable to me is, are exactly that. To me, it's about the process. To me, it's about What's gone on here? What has the community been told, committed to? And what have you done to try to change that, Mr. Developer? That's what it's about to me. And so I said to him, you need to work with the community. That's what you need to do. And so time passed. Do I have only five minutes left, Dave? I need to hustle here. Uh, it, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try to run through it quickly. So I, um, this was February, 
sometime around June, July, I get a call from the architect telling me that they have dropped the proposal into the port for processing. And I, it was a voicemail message on my cell phone. And I said, I'm going to try to forget. I'm going to try to act like I didn't hear that. A couple days later, I called the port staff. It was just eating me up. I called port staff and I said, did you get a proposal for the development of the, yes, commissioner, we did. I wasn't happy about that. I called, first thing I did is I called their PR guy and I said, did, did you guys do what I asked you to do? He says, no. My blood pressure went higher. I was not happy about what's taking place. There was, it, this is an old lease, 66 year lease that terminates also in 2034, I believe it is. He had, by rights of this old lease, the right to be heard within 90 days. Port's hands were tied. I was fit to be tied, but I said, look, we're going to do what we can to, to stop this. I said, I would rec highly recommend you guys call a timeout and reach out to the community. It was only then that he decided to have a couple of open houses. He had one in November and he had one in December. November's was a bit of a sham. Didn't allow you, the public, to weigh in. It was kind of an open house. I said, look, I understand why you did it. I represented a utility company for 38 years. I understand that, but that's not, that's not gonna work. In December, they change course and then they have, they have an open, a town hall like you should have had and allowed the public to weigh in. I don't know how many speakers, it was a lot of speakers. I'm sitting there with council member Donovan and I, and we're, we heard them speaker after speaker after speaker against the project. Again, the, the, the developer really had not worked out what worked with the community, but he's, he's forcing the matter along. Now, a couple of weeks ago, two weeks last Tuesday, to be precise, I remember it. It was a Valentine's day. I won't forget. The matter came before the board. Not for approval, but to start the process. Remember when I talked about Seaport Village? You start the process, you start doing the environmental assessment. Before you ever get to the point, then you require a, a port master plan amendment because the use isn't specific. That's where we're at with this project. I argued against it. I argued hard. I used the whole issue of the process being flawed. And I mentioned to my colleagues that that we had made promises to the community. That in the port master plan update of, look, it's not adopted yet, but it's real close, but we've been working on it since I think 2013 on what the future should be on that property. Port had already reported back that it was recommended to be open space for recreation. I made those arguments and I lost, folks. I lost on a four to three vote. And people say, well, Frank, I go, no, 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 not, old, not poor Frank. I'm a big boy. I can handle these kinds of things. It's unfortunate and it's unprecedented. And it's unprecedented, I told my colleagues, because when a member city, in my, in my experience of dealing at the Port of San Diego, my long experience, the port has always worked with the member city's wishes. And in this case here, it wasn't just me arguing it. They received a letter in December of 2022 saying we're against the project. And yet four of my colleagues voted for it. Voted to move it forward. Now, it's a long ways away. I chuckled recently when the, uh, the developer came out and said, look, we're gonna, we, I wanna be in construction in a year. Oh, good luck. You got a long way to go still. Not only are we gonna go through the environmental assessment stage of this thing, but then it's gonna require a port master plan amendment. And that's a big deal, folks. That's a big deal also. And so stay tuned. I strapped on my cleats, I'm ready to go. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one to go to. 
The test has been what's in the best interest for all Californians. Now, I've argued to say, look, the best for all Californians is to make it free for people to go there and access that shoreline. Not limited amount of people that can rent those cottages there. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes from there. I'm sure there's going to be questions about this as we go through, but I'm going to hustle through because my time is running out. This is the port master plan update timeline, folks. Remember I talked about the port has been engaging in these discussions about what the port lands throughout the entire port authority area, what it should be for the next 40 years. It hasn't been updated, I believe, since 1981. It's gone through several amendments, like the one that would be required for Seaport Village and for the case, but the port has been going through this master plan update to adopt, and we're really close to, to, do, to getting that thing adopted. I suspect that it will come back to the board to finalize that environmental impact report in August or September of this year. It'll be interesting because, again, the, the recommendation for the Coronado Cays shoreline park area, the, the Grand Caribe area, is for recreational open space. We'll see where it goes from there. So it'll, it has to go to Coastal Commission for final approval, and then it'll come back to the board for us to certify the, the Coastal Commission discussion. I covered a lot. Um, I hope that it was learning for you. I hope that I gave you some insights, not only on what the port district is, but what we're doing around the Bay. I hope that you, I, I gave you a perspective on the commitments or promises that were made back in the early 60s. If the people were willing to tax themselves what they would get and what they've gotten up into this, what we've all received in benefits up to this point, I think it's been an incredible success model. Um, it has political ramifications to it, no question about it. Um, but I'm real familiar with that. I know how to handle those kinds of things. I'm honored to be representing the city of Coronado on the commission. I'm honored to be back. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions that you may have.